right, I've been told we are at critical mass, so I can start. And uh, I want to thank you all for uh, coming to the Frost 19th Annual Breakfast in the Park here at the Frost Art Museum. This is our signature Art Basel event. Uh, here is our, here's Kenneth Hall. Thank you for being here. Um, we are, I'm Jordana Pomeroy, the director of the museum. And uh, we have the privileged position of closing out the events of the week, which welcomed art collectors, curators, artists, and art enthusiasts from around the world to Miami. Before I forget, please turn off your cell phones. I always forget to say that, but thanks, Mom, for reminding me. So, there's always one of you. There's always one of you in the crowd. Since I arrived in Miami nearly a decade ago, I've witnessed an explosion, I'm sure you have too, in the cultural sector of the city a reflection of several interconnected factors that have collectively transformed Miami. I have seen a wave of cultural entrepreneurship with artists, curators, and other creatives establishing galleries, studios, and art initiatives outside the museum walls. I have seen rich collaborations foster a sense of community. I tip my hat to Art Basel Miami Beach, which has played a pivotal role in putting Miami on the global cultural map. And speaking of maps, our honored Breakfast in the Park speaker today has thought about maps of all kinds ever since she was a little girl. When I was interviewing for director positions, I heard repeatedly, we want you to put our museum on the map. And I kept thinking, what map? What map am I supposed to put the museum on? So for fun, I decided to ask AI to envision a metaphorical map for excellence. It came up with Innovation Oasis, Resilience Ridge, Collaboration Canyon, and Passion Peninsula. Thanks, but no thanks, ChatGPT. As it turns out, we all run around with individual maps in our heads that guide our choices, including where we like to spend time, which generally means places that make us feel good, honored, and respected. And if you have had a good time here at the Frost Art Museum, please do consider becoming a member because we are very, uh, grateful to our members and your membership is valued and I'm happy to say we have a new membership manager thank you Lara I'm sure you're here or setting up on the second floor I'd also like to welcome here our new senior vice president of university advancement um, Kenneth and I don't see your wife Hannah but Kenneth thank you so much for coming to your first of many events here at the Frost Art Museum we're thrilled to have you our community partner, West Kendall Baptist Hospital, has grown in reputation because they look holistically at the well-being of individuals. This notion of good health includes participation in the arts. West Kendall Baptist has been our longtime community partner for Breakfast in the Park, without which we might just present you with a park with no delicious breakfast and no artist speaker. <laughs> Finally, um, we are grateful to the Green Family Foundation, whose continuing generosity to FIU and this museum reflects their commitment to the importance of the arts in higher education. Please welcome to the podium, Lourdes Bouet, the CEO of both Doctors and West Kendall Baptist Hospital. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning, and Jordana, it's always a pleasure to be here and supporting you in this wonderful event. Um, as Jordana said, we have been a very proud sponsor for almost 10 years now um, because we really believe in bringing arts and culture to our communities. You know, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine stated that making or even just seeing art can impact the brain. Whether as part of a creative arts therapy exercise or something you experience in your everyday life, art can help increase serotonin levels, and I'm sure most of you in this room know that, increase blood flow to the part of the brain that is associated with pleasure, foster new ways of thinking, and imagine, imagine a more hopeful future. That is very powerful. And as we look to really work towards the health and well-being of all the communities that we serve, it's just a natural partnership that we tie together with the Frost Museum to help bring this health and wellness through the arts 
to this growing South Florida community. So again, thank you all for being here and I look forward to a wonderful event as always. Our honored guest today, I'm always gonna cry about this, Joyce. Joyce Kozloff received her BFA from Carnegie Institute of Technology and an MFA from Columbia University. She is one of the major figures in the P&D movement and feminist art movements of the 1970s. In 1979, she began to increase the scale of her installations and focus on public art. Since the 90s, Joyce has turned to mapping as a device for coalescing her interest in history, culture, uh, government, wars, all kinds of things, and with the decorative and popular arts. She has received the Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome. Her work is found in many public and private collections, including my own, and that of Norma and Bill Roth, which you can see on the second floor in our galleries. You have also seen her work. You don't know it, maybe, but you have seen her work in many public places uh, throughout the United States, such as Reagan National Airport, LAX, and the Harvard Square T, which Joyce will discuss today. Years ago, I wrote a blog post that started, if I could be an artist, I would want to be Joyce Kozloff. As a young woman, she involved herself in grassroots political action and has never lost her fire. Will you please welcome Joyce Kozloff. So this is a selection of works over my career, mostly large major ones with huge gaps in between. But I, I, I think that the large major ones are what you can, you, you can show on a, on a screen and, and see by every, and see. Um, We have many tech techies here who are going to. So this is, um, we're going to have a conversation, but I know Joyce, and Joyce can carry the day. Um, but I have a lot of questions for Joyce, and you will have an opportunity afterward as well to ask her um, your own questions. Um, but I wanted to start with something that struck me when I was looking through your body of work, how beautiful your work is to look at. And then when you dig into it and you realize it's full of political commentary, a really fiery, interested, a lot of very highly critical work. But the first approach is this is a thing of beauty. And we talked a little bit about that last night because it's hard to achieve that balance. And I was wondering if you would comment on that. Um, yeah, could we turn the lights out? Lights. I mean, I can start talking. This is an early piece. This is from uh, uh, 1973. Um, I came out of a moment when the art that I studied in graduate school and that was all around me in the galleries in New York was very minimalist and austere. And I was part of a group of young artists that you'll see in the show upstairs that, that, that kind of wanted to tear that all down. And we formed a And uh, looking at the decorative arts, that in our high art, art history training, were never taught. And the, this has been a passion of mine ever since. So this painting um, is based on, um, which is called Three Facades, it's based on three churches in Mexico, um, two Rigorous churches and one uh, combination of brick and tile, and I've always loved the combination of different media. Um, anyway, this was my heraldic first statement in that, in that uh, movement. And then these paintings, I'm briefly going to talk about the paintings of the 70s, expand 
more architectural scale. Um, this one is called Three Points Triangle, and it's 1977, um, and it is 180, it's uh, 72 inches by 182 inches. So what happened with these later paintings as I moved into the 70s, um, I wanted you to move through them. Like, uh, travel was very important to me, and um, walking through the streets of a, a city that you didn't know and coming upon something, turning around a bend, looking through it, looking through a gate, and so this was um, inspired by a, a visit to Morocco, and um, so it's uh, the, the the carving in the wood and the tile work and the, and the carpets and the vistas beyond the cities. So, Joyce, can you turn, hold that a little closer? Like okay, can, uh, is that better? Yeah. I also want to say there are some, there are t two seats in the second and first row, and another one on the third <laughs> good, row. Good host, she's, she's, uh, used, to, she's used to the gang. What? You're used I, to gang. I think people should come up and take them. You know? <laughs> um, come on up. There may be more, but I can see these three right in front of me. Um, okay, so we're going to move on from this. Uh, you can raise your hands if you have questions. Um, this was a, uh, uh, an installation I made um, in 1979. And it traveled to four different locations, and in each location, I'm not, I'm not in this lecture showing them all, I adapted the parts to the different architectures of the different rooms. It's called An Interior Decorated. And it was a kind of a provocation, because interior decoration was so degraded in the art world. Yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about that um, uh, for our visitors who um, haven't lived and breathed it the way we have, um, about the hierarchy of art and what the movement really sought to, to accomplish? Well, we wanted to break down those hierarchies. And um, all of us, and those people upstairs as well, had something in our earlier life. Either we grew up in another part of the world, or, 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 or in the case of two of them, their, their fathers worked in government and were employed in different countries or something that made them, each of us, have a more expansive view of world art than the Western uh, art history we'd been taught. And we didn't see that. I mean, the art world was very small then. I mean, you got in Miami, Basel, and it's from all over the world. I mean, what was in the galleries in New York in the 1970s was all practically done in New York. And um, minimalist, and a lot of it was minimal. Sort of cool. It was very cool and minimalist. So we were a bunch of young artists who were thumbing our noses at that, and that this uh, um, I worked on this for about two years, and I'm not showing you all the details, but the tiles are made by rolling out uh, clay with a rolling pin and cutting the shapes with cookie cutters, and. Um, I had kilns in my studio, and uh, it's done in sections on grouted on wood. And each one of the pilasters is different and different combinations of. Um, and it's all low fire. If some of you are ceramists, so you can get a very nice range of colors in low fire. And the the uh, uh, textiles were printed at the fabric workshop in Philadelphia, and it's there are silk screens, and the same screens are used. But I used different colors of inks and different colors of silk that I printed it on to give a variation. Um, and this was something that kind of. Uh... So this is uh, this is this was at T. Bird and Ash, nineteen seventy nine, um, and I'm wondering how it was received at the time. Did people think it was? It was controversial, but it got a lot of attention. Well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> and that's what you want. Right, no publicity is bad publicity. <laughs> So where did you travel? Where were your inspirations taken well, from for these? these uh, I was in Mexico in 1978, and I 
started hanging out in the ceramics group and started doing vases. And this is these are commercial glazes. I, I don't mix my own glazes. Um, every single one is painted. Talk. Every single one of these tiles is like a little different painting. I work my way through books about arts of different places and each section until I used them up and then I took another book and I worked another group of them and until I, uh, that's the detail of the floor. But any detail of the floor would be different. Okay. And the motifs and the, and the silks, um, a lot of them are Egyptian. There was a big King Tut show that year at the Met. So I'm going to just go back for a minute. The This idea of this hierarchy of the arts, and some of you uh, actually teach art here, you're on faculty, but there's there's been a a place for both styles and, and mediums. So classical painting was always at the very, very top, and it was really reserved for men, for male painters, because it required a mastery of... Um, quite literally a mastery of portraying the human body. And to see a human body, especially nude, was reserved only for men in the studio. So the few women artists throughout time that dared, you know, enter that fray are pretty well known because there's so few of them. Um, but this kind of hierarchy is remarkable because it really stuck for four centuries. And it was truly at this point, I mean, this is a seismic shift in ideas. Women were uh, expected to paint flower paintings, in, and then there were just women's arts, which were basically needle arts, you know, sewing and crocheting and making lace. And, and that's, I think, why I was, what happened in the 70s was so remarkable. You see a lot of men actually entering. This is a quite an interesting question about feminism and women, what were traditional women's arts. You have men who are then picking up needlework and 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 making, you know, credible, like, museum-worthy works. I, I always say that the women, that the men in the pattern painting are female identified. You know, we talk about male identified, um, and, um, and I think they would agree with that, you know. I mean, they were very, very open, you know, some of them They were also equally involved in these ideas. So, um, but I want to move on. Okay? Yeah, um, it's your show. <laughs> um, I'm only on, on, on traditional. I know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep. I'll keep us at pace. Uh, so I got 18 public art books. This was the first commission that I got, um, and it just was an accident. I was working in tiles, and I got a solicitation from the. Uh, Arts on the Line program in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts to apply for a subway project. And I, uh, I've i been doing public art ever since. And this is uh, in the Harvard Square subway station. And it's called New England Decorative Arts. And again, it's about the decorative arts, but specifically to New England. And it's a series of episodes. When you enter on the right, you're sort of at eye level, about two feet up. But as you go down the ramp, it goes over your head, and then you go down. It's, it connects the bus, the bus station and the train tunnels. Um, but then when you go up this ramp, you get closer at the other end. So I thought about that. I, I always make a model before I do a project. And I thought about it, what it would be like to be a little person moving through that model and what you would see from different places. So it kind of gets broader and looser in the middle and more detailed on the ends when you can actually get right up to it. Um, I'm showing you a few details. This, this is from the bottom side looking up the ramp. And I should say, I'm not going to dwell on this, that this piece is a ruin. They have, the program doesn't exist anymore. And there's no percent for art in the state of Massachusetts. There's no money for it. There's nobody who cares. Um, I've been for years trying to negotiate, to find someone to negotiate with. But it, the, the tiles are cracking and uh, uh, the glazes are falling off because moisture is coming through the wall. And it was badly engineered and it, it moved and set up cracks. Anyway, 
this is how it looked in its prime. Um, and if we could turn more lights off, it would look better. Um, anyway, this central section is based on, uh, there were these uh, people who went from house to house with stencils and stenciled kind of wallpaper motifs on the walls uh, because in those days it was too expensive to import wallpaper from Europe. So um, they would live in the house while they were doing all these motifs. And they also had stencils for houses and trees and they would make these, these landscapes. So this is my New England landscape. Um, yeah, from a book I had of stencil motifs. Actually, this is a remarkable lithograph, and I want to give a, a little shout-out to Judith Salodkin, because Judith Salodkin, this is a, a very complex work. Um, I think it was it's 26 colors, oh, 45 colors, many, many colors, and um, Judith uh, worked with Joyce. Judith was the first um, graduate of the Tamarin School of Lithography, and really, uh, yeah, t t and out in New Mexico, and she was very, um, really a pathbreaker. Uh, and and it's a, this is a beautiful work. You can't appreciate how it's a long work. It's like so this is of the not of the print. Piece. Oh, okay. okay. Jordana owns a lithograph based on this, which is very close to it, which was printed by master printer Judas Lowe. Um I wanted to show you a few details of the artwork when mm -hmm. I showed the artwork. Um, so, but it looks very similar. Sure. And, um, this one is way better. This one is way better. Okay, I'm not showing you any more details um, <laughs> of this. Um, next. All right, this, now we're jumping ahead. Into maps, kind of mapping. Yes. Um, I had gone to Vietnam, and I had memories from the nightly news of the war there. And before the war was over in 1965 to 1974, but now I made this artwork in 1996. And um, it doesn't predict the war, and I went to the country from my memory bank of those images of the war. Um, and uh, it was a very young country. And um, I had this artwork rolled up in my storage. I, it was a failure. It was a, it was a long paper piece collage. Um, I always make collages from leftovers of my prints when they're off print or off register. And this was from an, a later print. And, um, and when I came back, I glued down uh, the Mekong River, which goes through Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, up into Thailand, up into China. And um, it was the site of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the coverage of the war, for those of us old enough to remember. And the piece was too high for the ceiling in my studio, so I, I made this kind of... Uh, what would you call it? Canopy. Canopy. And, and for me, that I had been to Vietnam, and I'd been to the, the palaces in Hawaii, and, and that kind of evoked that for me. These panels, um, I did a subway piece in Los Angeles about the movies, with stills from the movies, which I didn't show you. Um, and these are stills from movies of the years of the Vietnam War. American movies and some are uh, far, uh, European movies. They're not movies about the war, which were made after the war. These are movies that were made during those years. Um, and for me, which evoke memories of the conflict and violence of those years and the war. So that's what this piece is about. And yet it's such a beautiful work. <laughs> you know, it's, a just, it's, like, it's impossibly beautiful, and I think you... I, at least I read that you used <clears throat> postcards that you picked up in Vietnam to yeah, create it. And, and I went to the markets and there were these little foil things. So it's all embedded into the piece. Um, uh, there's a seven-hour audio tape 
in which um, I'm reading a book called The Sorrows of War by Bao Min, who's a great North Vietnamese writer. Uh, it's the saddest book I ever read. And I was just going to read excerpts of it, and I couldn't. So I, I, I was in a sound booth, which I rented for a day, and I, I, I read the whole book. And nobody ever listened to it. <laughs> you know, but it's in the background. Yes. And it was my way of trying to bring all this together, because I know that people are going to look at the work and say, oh, I mean, they came into my studio, my friends, and said, oh, that's really beautiful. And how can I convey all this other information? So you're, you're right about your question. Um, the next one, I think, is more obvious. This piece, see, I'm doing the split screen to show a detail in the all over. This piece I did at 99-2000 and called Targets. And what you're seeing is maps of all the places the U.S. bombed between 1945 and 2000, when, it, when I completed it, between the end of World War II and 2000. And um, there are 24 uh, maps. And you walk in, and three or four people can walk in. And then there's a door, which I guess I didn't show you a picture of, which is the last panel on wheels, and it pulls in, so that you're completely surrounded. And if you're two or three people and you start speaking, your voices are amplified. There's an echo, which I hadn't planned. It was a gift. Um, How did it change the work, the experience I think work? it makes it very, very much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And some people want to leave. They push the door and they leave. They get feel claustrophobic and scared at the sound of these voices, they, their own voices. And uh, other people really like it. Um, and um, Joyce, there's a lot of conversation also about. I mean, I, when I read about your work about air, your use of Google Maps and aerial maps. Okay, and I, I also wanted to. We're sort of entering a, a map moment um, where maps. You made me think again, looking through in preparation for this conversation about you know maps throughout. The centuries and how they they're like little peepholes into history you know and 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 where and cosmology which is something that you seem to have such an amazing grasp of and you're going to see a lot of examples of this as we move forward i'm an amateur uh cartographer um i i, I love maps lots of people use maps and lots of artists have used maps um Choice. Yeah, talking. Everything seems to be cut off on that end. Maybe the projector could be moved a little. All right, never mind. Um, this one is called Dark and Light Continents, uh, 2002. It should be much darker, but there's all this light in here. Um, this was a, a map that was going around on the internet of the way of a satellite photograph of the Earth, and the northern hemispheres were brightly lit and the southern hemispheres were very dark. Um, so I, I had this idea of making a, a nocturnal globe um, after making targets, but this is like the, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the way a globe is designed and then, it, then it's glued down onto the surface. Those are called the gores of the globe. And um, so this is like a flat globe against the wall. And it's 192 feet long, 96 feet tall. So some people think they look like surfboards. But um, they, uh, I also use these little star stickers on it. But this, I, I usually need to have more than one layer of content in the piece. So this is a, a, uh, the track of a satellite in space. And my idea for this was to be in space and look down at the Earth. So, um, and then the stars in the formation of a star chart from 1600. So these would be the constellations. It's in the U.S. Embassy in Sudan. Is that true? The U.S. Embassy in Khartoum, Sudan. Whoa. Um, it was bought by uh, Art and Embassies program, 
and they buy, buy art for all the embassies. And, it, you know, anyway. We've talked about some of the works that are absolutely not even visible anymore to the public and not really accessible. No idea, because there is awards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, that's where it is. And, and this one, I did a whole series of round paintings. I'm only showing you one. Um, and this one has a motor, so, uh, which which is it's like a lazy Susan, but it's in the wall and it's heavy. I had it made, and you just touch it and it turns. You just touch the side and it. Turns. How large? How large is it's large, right? Is it? The, it's this sharp motor that's in the wall. Uh -huh. and it sits on it, uh -huh. and, you, and you push it and it turns, and it's called revolver. And I'm getting closer to the present. This is 2008. Uh, it's it's actually very simple. Then it's on this motor. Um, and in these tondi, these round paintings, um, oh, this one is um, 96 inches in diameter. Um, and I made it in four sections. Um, I, I painted uh, uh, cosmological charts in the heavens. These two are Chinese, and these two are Arabic charts of the heavens. And the earlier one, I had Western charts of the heavens. And these are some of the uh, cosmological creatures in the um, Arabic charts. And in the Chinese one, I, I started working in another body of work I'm not showing, called Boy's Art, um, about uh, boy, the maps of war that boys make. And these are boys' war toys called Warhammer. You can see them. Can you see them in that one and that one? I painted them, and they're, they're sort of coming through. And when you turn it, it, it becomes kind of scary. Um, uh, someone taught, my, my dealer had a 13, 12, 13-year-old boy when I was doing these, this work, and she told me about this Warhammer, and I ordered their uh, catalogs, and uh, they have... Uh, these war toys, and the boys buy them and make these wars, and they, anyway, that's what that comes from. <laughs> this, this one absolutely intrigued me, and it's so hard to describe. This, I have to say, I think this work, you probably could spend two hours going, at least, just going into the depths and layers, but I love the title, oh, geez, so... The Everstorf map, yeah. So what ha this? I made this piece called G's in 2012. Um, a, a, a scholar of medieval maps came to me and asked me if I would do a work based on the famous Ebstorf map of the year 1250, 1250. And she asked two other artists, an English artist and an Indian artist, who were well known um, in their countries, um, and she never found that she she's an independent scholar, and she never found a location to do this show. But I I did my Epsworth piece, this Epsworth map, uh, uh, medieval map of the world. This is the form that medieval world world maps usually were circles, and many of them were Crusader maps, and usually Jerusalem is in the center, um, and they're Christian maps, and that's the head of Christ at the top, the feet at the bottom, and the hands on either side. And this is very large. This is like way large. And there's, I saw in Germany a copy of it. This map was probably the greatest medieval map, and it was destroyed by um, Allied bombing in World War II. It was in a monastery in Germany. Um, and, but there are copies of it. So this is my version of oh, G's, and I was riffing on the head, feet, and hands of Christ and started adding uh, images of Christ from everything, from the history of art and from popular culture. And it, this thing was able to absorb more and more and more stuff. It, uh, it it just seemed endless, and I also painted on it everything that was in the Ebstorf map, although I didn't uh, put in any of the text. But I I painted 
um, all the little figures uh, from the original, and then I started adding all this other stuff. And, it, and I didn't do anything around the edges at first. And then my friend Bob Kushner, who's in the show upstairs, came to my studio and said, what about the baby Jesus? And I had no babies in it. And it was filled up, and so I, all the babies are around the outside. It's uh, a huge piece. Did you do it on commission, or was it... No, no. Uh, uh, it's... Uh, 144 by 144, but it's on uh, 36 panels that are two feet square. So I, I, I painted it in sections. My, my ceiling in my gallery in my studio isn't tall enough, so I had I hung as much as I could in my studio because I like to hang what I'm working on and work on it and see it. Um, so anyway, this is called G's, and uh, I think I have some G's. One... It's like Bosch. It's like a Bosch. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, more I just need to go to the top of the book. Okay. Um, so, how are we doing? We're, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes. And um, I do want to tell you that this, I, I've never seen this work, and you told me it's not very um, accessible anymore, which is really sad because it's, it is, it kind of brings together so much of your previous work, so... Um. Oh, this is my most recent public art collection. And it's in, it's in a federal courthouse in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I, it's called Memory and Time, and I installed it in 2021. It was a commission from the General Services Administration. And... Um, Imperfect. Okay. Um, uh, there are um, 17 artworks in this one room, and I worked with the architect um, Craig, Craig Brandt in Chicago, in a Chicago art firm, and we worked it out. There were niches in his design, and he said, go ahead and fill them. Um, it's a combination of ceramic pit, uh, tiles and glass mosaic. And I can show you any glass mosaic in the world, but I have more glass mosaics in the world. It's the same thing. So it's a customs light, and it's a very big thing, so it's not just a piece of wood. Anyway, um, so the bottom sections are maps of that area. Um, uh, And each of them I chose because of the, it, it, it's musical and resonance. So, um, I mean, is this such an important work of history because of its um, its views of textile mills and Bloody Thursday? And you've embedded, yeah. And I'm also just want to point out that you, in some senses, it's ideal to work with the architect rather than come in after the fact, which I imagine has happened. You've had, you've had it all. This was the best made. And, and this may be my last public art. Anyway, um, this panel on the left, um, okay, oh, I didn't write all this down. But um, this is a really interesting map. This is the map of the land that was ceded by the Cherokee to the state of South Carolina. So those lines indicate the territory that was ceded. There are several, several stages in which this happened. See, it says it right there, a map of land ceded by the Cherokee to the state of South Carolina. And the, I, what's around it are motifs from Cherokee baskets. And the mosaicists brilliantly were able to cut the little pieces of glass, mm. like to make it look like a woven basket. Uh, the I painted these maps. That I painted all of these pieces, and the the part that is in ceramic tile um, 
was printed on high fire glazes in Italy. Uh, fr uh, uh, my 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 studies, my watercolor studies were scanned and it was printed, and the and the mosaicist cut it and put it and put it all together. That one is another. On the one wall, the maps are surrounded by uh, Cherokee basketry motifs. On the other side, the maps are surrounded by quilt motifs. And um, this one um, was um, an early map, and you see the geography is all wrong. Um, the map, the, the quilt, is a quilt that was painted by two sister slaves who um, were stayed in the family after the Civil War. The family gave this quilt to the It's a very famous quilt. Um, anyway, that's a, that's something to talk about. That's a very complex story, but we don't have any time. <laughs> um, and this section above, in the center of the room. So what you see is I might have to go back to show the mill towns. There are eight images of from Google Earth of mill towns because Greenville was the textile capital of the 19th century, early 20th century. And I went down there, I started going around the mills and the school system. That became the center of story. And um, then the history of textiles in the region expanded. Um, So those are the mills across the top, and there are eight altogether. That I, I, I took them off Google Earth. These are ones that still exist that I could find on Google Earth. Most of them don't exist anymore. This, this, the, uh, the mill towns have all left and gone overseas, and it, it's, it was the dominant industry in the 19th century. Um, this, these are all printed on ceramic tile from my drawings, uh, and I drew the textile pattern made in that mill over the Google Earth photograph of the mill. I don't have details of it, but you can, can you see that there are different textile patterns on each one? Okay. Um, and this Chicola mill, which is the center thing that you see, walk in through the gate. Um, as I was researching the mill, I found out about something I didn't know anything about called Bloody Thursday. Joyce, baby, hold us up. So okay. Okay. Called Bloody Thursday. 1934 was the largest strike in American history. And it was mostly textile workers. And um, they, they came down very, very hard on them. And in this place, Honeopath, South Carolina, Chiquola Mill, on uh, September 6, 1934, the mayor, who was also the owner of the factory, came down with a posse of men and shot the unarmed uh, picketers in front of the factory. And seven people died, and 30 people were injured. And I, th there's very little known about this. Um, Many, many years later, the grandson of the man who led the massacre, uh, who, who grew up there and never knew about this because they put into effect a, a um, uh, I, I forget the expression, but no one could ever go back to work in the factory and talk about this again. Um, so it, it, the next generations didn't know about it. The grandson, um, uh, grew up there and didn't know about it. And he became an independent filmmaker in New York, and he saw some film about the strikes of 1934 and some mention to it, and he did some research and he wrote a book about it, which I read. Uh, there is no monument there, and in the center I have the factory, and it's all rubble. Can you see that? It's just rubble, and they've never taken the rubble away, and they've never put a monument there or anything. So I decided to make this the center of my piece, and the story is on the text underneath. Let's, um, we have a couple more slides, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Well, the slides are recent work. 
Um, Never seen before, previewed here. Okay. So I did these paintings in um, 20, uh, 20, 20, 21, during the height of the pandemic, and they're all Civil War battles. When I went to South Carolina to do my research, I started, and it was before Charlottesville, I started seeing these Confederate flags, and, and I, I was shocked. I was sort of uh, not expecting that, and I realized how present the Civil War is in our country. So I came back, and a friend of mine, who is the only one I know who participates in reenactments, is an artist, who I taught with at MICA, said I should look at the Civil War maps. And these maps, I did um, 13 paintings of 13 battles. And I put viruses on them. And their viruses are from the internet. And they're different viruses. They're not all COVID. And it doesn't, it's not terribly logical, but it expressed kind of my state of mind um, that they don't really, the, the viruses are not... Uh, designated viral outbreaks. They're about this undercurrent of uh, trauma. And um, so I, the battles um, uh, and the drawings, some were by Confederate soldiers and some were by Union soldiers. And um, this one, uh, th this battle of Vicksburg and the battle of, Ch of what's the other one? New Madrid. New Madrid, uh, as they say, New Madrid. Uh, okay. They were both Union victories, and important ones, actually. So you see my decorative impulse is always there in the work. And uh, as you say, you know, people don't always see the content. But that's my sensibility. And when I, uh, when I work on these issues, I've been working, I've been doing cartography for more than 30 years, and a lot of it has had to do with war and conflict. Um, I have to find my own visual language to talk about these things. I can't, you know, most political art is black and white and graphic and in your face. And I, I mean, I just don't do that. So I can try to figure out a way to say what I want to say in my own way. So that's what these are. And, and what I'm going to show you next in January. They're not on my website. No one's seen them. Um, whoops. Oh, we missed that one. Chattanooga. What else did we miss? Okay. Okay. Now, uh, these are the new paintings. They're all 60 inches square. I've made 10 of them in the last year and a half. And they're all zones of conflict. They're all war zones. I'm only showing you a couple of them. And what I've embedded into them is, again, the decorative arts, the, the carriers of popular culture, as I, say, I like to say. Uh, the, the, uh, the things that are lost and destroyed, the cultural property that's lost and destroyed, uh, along with major monuments, but I'm not painting, painting major monuments in here. Right, of course. Um, and uh, so anyway, these are going to be at DC Moore, yes. or mm -hmm. it's opening the fourth of January. I love I love your gallery. I have to say, DC Moore has great artists. So a shout out for DC Moore. Yeah. I've been with them for twenty eight years. It's my second largest. They love you too, clearly. Uh, and uh, I can go back if you want me to talk about these wars. I mean, I think. No. Well, I think we should probably open up to Q&A, and um, Sudan, which we mentioned before. Oh, where your and other work is. I went with uh, four women friends on the Silk Road to Xinjiang province in China 12 years ago, and the Chinese have turned, uh, turned the whole thing into a concentration camp. Oh. Well, anyway. you know, Joyce, I just wanted to mention one thing, and we... In, we end on war, but I do want to mention your levity too, which is the Pornament series always brings laughter to. I mean, I'm always laughing when I see. It. I just love that series. I like how it, it is a series sort of based around the Kama Sutra. I don't know if there were other erotic. Many, many 
many different, you know, examinations of erotica, and they're smaller works, and these teeny tiny panels that are quite explicit, um, embedded in beautiful sort of textiles. Are, are they, they watercolors or it's watercolor, very saturated paper, beautiful, but they're funny because they're just so unexpected. They're things that, yeah, unexpected contexts. Yeah, I didn't show any, um, <laughs> I didn't show any small ones. So thank you, Joyce. This has been a real pleasure. Any questions for Joyce Kozloff? Yes. And Joyce, if you just wouldn't mind using the mic, that would be perfect. As you did these pieces of art, which are beautiful, um, the colors are really interesting. And I wanted to ask you, did you choose these colors, um, giving it meaning to the place where you're um, portraying and, and the different uh, political and, and the people? I mean, why did you choose those colors? Um. That's a very good question. Um, people think the work takes me a long time to do because of the detail. That doesn't take long. What takes long is conceiving it, what I'm going to put together, and the color. The co and uh, yeah, so how, is, how am I going to suggest this time and place through the colors I choose? And in some cases, they give me that time and place. Um, so it's, it's a has to do with association and um, yeah. okay we have another question I just wanted to ask why do you pick war is it like because it's exciting or something why have I dealt with war in my work uh, I think going back to Vietnam, um, the, just the uh, horror of aerial bombardment of civilian populations and that we don't really see it. Um, and I just wanted to uh, find a way to represent that. Thank you, Joyce. Another question here. Probably more comment than question. Uh, I found the book Boy's Life. Boy's Life. Purchased it many years ago. And it is, I, I'm po possibly part of my question is in this idea of breaking the hierarchy of art, I feel like what I own is not a representation of art. It is the work of art, uh, the way the book looks. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, I first was fascinated with that concept that I felt like I could afford and I could have in my possession uh, this collection of images. Uh, what had struck me when I first found it, I didn't know you at the time I found the book, was um, the title juxtaposed to a female name artist. And mm -hmm. so uh, this idea of super intense often disturbing subjects, uh, collaged with sometimes what seems even whimsical or political culture and other ways, embedded in uh, another thing that fascinates me, and I think you're playing with it all the time, because uh, I've seen a bunch of stuff today I, I wasn't aware of, uh, which makes me feel more connected with you because uh, the power of globes and maps and that kind of organization of information and juxtaposing almost absurd imagery uh, together, I think is a really powerful way of getting messages across. Uh, so Thank you. I really appreciate uh, this body of work, particularly these latest ones. Uh, just a little side note, I'm working with some students on a comic book where we're taking stories directly from students in Ukraine. And so I will, if you don't mind, share my picture I just took with the university in Ukraine of the map that you have. Okay. Because the idea of the people who are in these struggles uh, not being forgotten 
and being represented. Thank you. So, so uh, anyway, so I yeah, want to know how are... intentional was, let's say, the equity of providing a, a book to somebody like me that I could actually buy a, a work of art. Um, both the books that you mentioned, um, uh, Patterns of Desire, and the book that you mentioned, uh, Boys Art, are, um, uh, I don't know, 30 watercolors and very, very finished and, very, and printed exact, in, in the case of Boys Art, the exact scale of the drawings. They're reduced in, in uh, Patterns of Desire. But, um, yeah, you can look at them. And Boys Art might have been my first book about war. My son made these drawing, intricate drawings when he was a little boy of the battles of the superheroes. And I remembered that my brothers used to make these battle drawings, battleships with guns on them, and, and, and girls don't do that. And I always wondered about it. Um, I'm told by younger friends that now it's more video games, that there's not that much uh, hand drawing of battles. But um, I made this book in which I cut up my son's, uh, and with his permission, um, uh, childhood, which I kept because they're great battle drawings, and reduced them down in scale and embedded them into these maps of historic battles. But I didn't show that. All right, one last question. Uh, going back to some of the things you said at the beginning of your talk, um, talking about the 70s and not being recognized because you were a woman, I'm just curious as to how you did break in and become embraced by the gallery scene or the uh, museum um, scene. Okay. Um, well, the pattern and decoration movement took off. Um, we... We thought of ourselves as, you know, outsiders, and uh, and we took off for a couple of years. We were the hot young thing, and we were in Europe, and we were here, and we were collected, and we were shown. The art world moved on, you know, <laughs> lost interest very quickly, uh, which I guess always happens. Uh, we weren't prepared to be, you know, recognized, and then we were prepared to be forgotten, and it just all happened very fast. Um, but... Um, <laughs> short, short memory that we have. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't think a lot of people, that's very nice, this, the, the Ross collection, and in recent years there have been some, some shows, of uh, museum shows of the pattern decoration movement, but it's generally not taught or remembered in many places. Um, and my career... My personal career was very good that I got involved with public art when I did, and uh, I've been able to work on a much larger scale than I could have ever worked on my own. And um, I, I was mentioning that in the 70s, all these percent for art programs came into being, that at the NEA, the GSA, and then states and cities all over the country. And uh, you apply, you know. You, you, you apply. Um, and a lot of women started doing public art because the gallery museum system was so closed to women. Um, and a lot of great public art you can see by women. Yeah, that was... Anyway, I, I don't know. I, I've been very lucky. I've been with the same gallery for 28 years, as I said. And I, I don't have galleries in any other cities, just New York. I mean, I can barely, I work very slowly, you know. Well, you know, um, in addition to um, our breakfast, do make sure you at least check out our pattern, the Roth collection, Embellish Me, on the second floor. And then there's um, a show that um, our chief curator, Amy Galpin, uh, put together riffing off um, that, which is um, to recognize a pattern, uh, which comes from another private collection as well as contemporary artists whose aesthetic uh tips a hat to everything that you all did in the 70s with the pattern decoration movement. And we are so glad that you did because, as I said, it was a seismic shift in the way that art history was written about, thought about, and taught. So will you please thank Joyce Kozloff and enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself on the patio, and thank you, West Kendall Baptist, for making this possible.
Thank you.